one of the biggest mistakes people make in stocks is they think about the business qualitatively and they say, oh, well, this is good and this is bad and therefore, you know, if I see more good than bad, I might buy the stock and if I see more bad than good, um, I might uh, do the opposite. And, and that's a really stupid sort of way um, to, to sort of look at the markets because it's not about um, good or bad. And, I, and I've said this a million times. Um, if, if you had a, I don't know, let's see, let's have some fun here. If you had a bag, this is a bag um, of, I don't know, $1,000. You had 10 smackers in here, 10 Benjis, as we say from Brooklyn, 10, 10 sticks, 10 bills. I don't know, I'm getting all, getting back to my old Brooklyn style here. And uh, there's six of them. I might as well draw the last couple of bills here. And your friend Big Rolls, he gives you this bag of cash. And, and you notice on the bag, it's got this nasty stain on it. You don't know what it is. And you say, ugh, Big Rolls, why'd you give me this? this nasty bag with $1,000. Now, it's still worth $1,000. You might have gotten it from Big Rolls and you might have a nasty stain on it and uh, uh, it doesn't look so great, um, but it's still worth $1,000. Now, if Tiffany's gave you one of their, you know, boxes, and it's a light blue box, isn't it? It's a light blue box and it's got this nice pink trim and it says Tiffany on it. And it's got um, just a hundred dollars in there. You know, sure. You know, you you know, it's easy to say. Um, and the hundred dollar bill is crisp and clean, whereas big rolls is cash. You know, you see some weird residue on it. It's sometimes torn up. Um, you know, it's got some strange phone number on it. You don't know what's going on there. Um, you know, my point is, of course, that that just because something looks good or, or things are getting better um, doesn't mean that the value is changing. Um, and the same thing applies here. It's a really pretty box and it's got a brand name on it, but you know, the, the box isn't worth $600. It's worth $100. Um, maybe it's worth $105 because it's got the Tiffany box and this thing's worth $995 because um, your friend, uh, your dubious friend gave it to you. But at the end of the day, and it's got this weird stain on it, at the end of the day, the, the, what you should be focused on is the value of the cash flow, not the, the sort of things that surround it. Um, so what's happening with Gilead is, is really big problems. So the, their hepatitis C business is basically disappearing. Um, it was half their business in 2016. It's going to go to zero. Um, I assume it's going to go to zero. I'm fine with that. The HIV business is, is never going to grow again. It's so large that it, it really, they've got all the HIV patients, GSK, Merck, and Bristol have, um, a couple, but um, a little bit of market share, but they've dominated HIV. It's really hard to grow from here. They don't have another business other than HIV and Hep C, and their pipeline sucks. So why would you buy a stock like this? It's sort of like this thing. Well, I would buy this bag. I want to buy it for nine hundred ninety-five dollars, right? But would I buy it for oh, I don't know, say five hundred dollars? Sure, I would. I would, you know, have to go meet my friend Big Rolls in in Brooklyn somewhere on a street corner. And the bag would smell bad and I don't know where this money came from, but for $500, I'm willing to take the risks. And I would not buy this Tiffany bag for $600. You know, I would, I would pay no more than maybe 105 for it. So the reason is Gilead's maybe the ugliest, it's got the ugliest so-called fundamentals that exist. The business is bad. It's not getting any better. It's going to be bad for a very long time, um, but it's still worth it. Um, why? Well, it's an $81 billion company right now. That's the enterprise value. And the 2018 earnings is about um, $14 billion or $15 billion. And that's earnings excluding R&D. So I like to adjust excluding R&D. And if you need some more evidence on why I think that's a good idea, you can watch some of my videos. But this is five times earnings. So um, really an incredible deal. This is almost a 20% yield. And I think I showed you earlier from just basic finance, you can't get a 20% yield anywhere. Um, it, the, the LIBOR is 1%, treasury bonds are 1% or 2%, corporate bonds are 3 to 4%, even the S&P 500, which is just equities, the earnings yield is 6%. So here you've got almost a 20%, I don't know, this is like 17%, 17% earnings yield. Um, so really incredible. Basically all the business has to do is not shrink too fast, really. 
um, and then you'll be okay. What are the big risks? Why? How does this $14 billion drop? Now it's gonna drop, um, but it's not gonna drop to like five billion. It's gonna, it maybe drops to 10 billion or 12 billion. And, and the real issues here are, if there's an HIV cure, I actually think it'll be Gilead who makes it. So everyone who's doing research for an H a true HIV cure, um, really Gilead's in the forefront there. Now there, there's HIV vaccines out there, um, and uh, J&J has is, is got a vaccine, Merck's got a vaccine, a few other companies actually, and Gilead doesn't appear to have a vaccine. If a vaccine gets approved, I don't think that it'll eat into their current business. It'll actually prevent new patients from becoming HIV patients, which obviously would be a great thing for society. Um, so the, the real risk would be an HIV cure that doesn't come from Gilead. But I think that they're, they're really on top of that. Then there's a Merck drug that, that could be a big problem as well. Um, now notice that I'm not putting Hep C as a risk because the Hep C business is going to disappear. That's something we know. That's not a risk. Again, if you look at investments like this, Maybe it's a risk to you, but you have to look at investments as to kind of what is the market? What would su surprise the market? Hep C sales disappearing, it wouldn't surprise the market. In fact, that's an upside risk, I would say. It's a good thing. If Hep C doesn't disappear at all, I'm assuming it's going to disappear. If it doesn't disappear, or if it disappears more slowly, then Gilead stock is even better. So keep that in mind. And I'm also being conservative with HIV. I said earlier that they have no more patients to get, that they have all of the... Uh, the patients out there. Well, that's not totally true. They, they could have better pricing. They could have better global uh, access to patients. So they, they have this PrEP, which is a big, uh, kind of a big marketplace, um, this pr prophylactic um, pre-exposure prophylaxis. So th there are some ways for HIV to grow. They have this big Tagrovir drug coming. So there's still some reasons to like that. Anyway, I just thought I'd sort of explain why, you know, an ugly duckling like Gilead can actually be worth quite a bit. So I think that you know, in certain models, I have it worth about 120 billion, sometimes even worth as much as 150 billion. So, um, you know, we'll sort of see um, where Gilead ends up. But I, I thought, you know, because it's the largest position in the portfolio that I'd explain it a little bit. Okay, so in a month like this, you know, shorts are, are sort of the place to be. Um, and you never know what month is gonna be good and what month is gonna be bad or what years even. Sometimes you have years, years and years and years where where there are no shorts, or, or shorts are, are, are far and few between. And sometimes it's the opposite. Um, I have a friend who said, uh, one of my coworkers, he said, oh, everything on my screen is red today. And he's sort of new to the stock market. And I said, you know, I, I've been in a situation where that's every day for three years, from 2000 to 2012. I'm sorry, 2000, that would be a long time. 2000 to 2002, every single day, every stock was down, you know, one or 2%. And that was for three years until that abated. So, you know, we've been very coddled and used to this big success, but, um, you know, there will be uh, times when, when, uh, when that happens. Uh, we've had everything green for two or three years. So, you know, it takes a lot of, of, of patience to sort of, um, um, sort of survive markets like that. And I think that it makes sense to, to be market neutral even and have that discipline, even if, you know, your shorts uh, are really going to punish you because the market's rising. When the market's falling, your shorts are, are there to save you. And this is a good example of uh, the top biotech stocks I follow. There's two that went up a lot this month. Um, and uh, I can't make heads or tails of this one. Um, and quite frankly, the same with, with Fibrogen. But if you look at all these stocks, I mean, it's like shooting fish in a barrel to pick out these shorts. Now, I wasn't short any of these. And I feel really stupid, quite frankly, for not seeing the following stocks as shorts. I didn't short Myelin, I didn't short Teva, I didn't short Endo. These are all really, I wouldn't say easy, but um, these were pretty simple. You can say Malincrot and Valiant and Sun. These were pretty simple shorts to get. Um, you know, basically every generic company is telling you that it's Armageddon. The, the Myelin CEO even started um, her conference call by saying uh, the times are changing. Um, you know, usually these conference calls are pretty boring events. So when you need to, to pull out the Bob Dylan lyrics to explain the current state of affairs in the business, um, yeah, maybe I missed it because I was distracted. Um, very good point there. But, um, you know, this, is, this was sort of free money if you think about it. Um, in fact, there probably still are some stocks that are shorts that are free money. I mean, 
Um, Endo, I'm not sure how they get out from under this crushing debt load. Now, um, you know, have to take a look at that further. I'm looking at their bond situation. Teva, oh boy, I don't know what to say about Teva, but, um, you know, it's, it's sort of a terrible and nasty situation. So a lot of companies thought it was a good idea, including myself, quite frankly, to lever up and buy old specialty pharmaceutical or generic products, Valiant being the poster child of that. And um, now many of these companies are paying the price. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's sort of how bull markets end, to be frank. But uh, regardless, you know, thankfully, my businesses have survived. And it's probably more a function of not being, not getting infinite capital uh, to borrow. Um, and there are some companies that have done okay with the strategy, like Horizon and some others. But, uh, you know, there are um, a lot of companies, Mylan, Valiant, that have to pay the price for, for leveraging up and buying businesses that they weren't sure were that great. So in any event, um, if you were short any of these stocks, we were short Neurotrope, but we had a secret short, uh, which we haven't talked about, which I don't think we're ever going to talk about, sadly, because it's all already gone down so much. But we got two of those and none of the longs, so pretty good for this month so far.